thank you for being here. Austin McCoy, Assistant Professor of History at Auburn University. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Andy. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, and um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in uh, this evening. Um, like, yeah, this, this session sort of came as a surprise to me. Like, I wrote a piece for uh, AHA Perspectives for the American Historical Association. Uh, and, no, Andy reached out uh, a few months ago and asked if I would come talk about uh, this little uh, blog post that I wrote about defunding the police. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, Andy already said that I uh, teach at uh, Auburn University. I'm a historian. Um, I study um, 20th century uh, African-American history, uh, U.S. political history. Um, I'm working on a book right now that's you know tentatively titled The Quest for Democracy, Black Power, New Left, and Progressive Politics in the Post-Industrial Midwest. Uh, so I I pay a lot of attention to protests, uh, community organizing, and social movements. And, you know, part of this, like part of my research agenda uh, is not just intellectual, but it's also personal. I've, uh, you know, worked as, you know, I've done some organizing work, uh, especially when I was in Ann Arbor. Um, and most related to this topic, um, I was working with folks in the community and on campus in response to the Ann Arbor Police Department uh, killing Aura Rosser, a 40-year-old black woman. And this uh, took place in November 2014. So and it was a couple weeks before the St. Louis County prosecutor announced that they would not press charges against Darren Wilson. So many of these conversations about defunding the police, they're not new. Um, and it was a conversation that some of us even had in terms of raising this demand, right? I mean, so when we talk about uh, defund the police. It's a slogan, but it's also a demand. And I and I'm wanna I'm I'm making that clear because I think then some of the questions and some and some folks who are wondering, well, why didn't they choose another word might become clearer to you. So the immediate context, as we all know, you know, the uh you know this country has been uh sort of consumed by uh social protest, unrest. Uh, in responses to the murder of George Floyd uh, on May 25th, 2020, but then also uh, you had the death of Breonna Taylor um, so a few months before, and then uh, Ahmaud Arbery, who was uh, killed while running, and he was killed by a couple of uh, vigilantes, uh, you know, vigilantes. Uh, so, you know, you we've had this sort of series of state violence or um, vigilante violence against black people um, that's been taking place in the midst of this COVID crisis. And on the heels of George Floyd's murder, um, you had Minneapolis activists who've been doing work uh, around policing over the last, you know, seven, eight years, at least as it relates to Black Lives Matter. But then also, again, police brutality is an issue that uh, black people have been organizing against for decades, right? But when thinking about this immediate moment, um, you had black activists from this organization called Black Visions uh, that began to tweet out, uh, you know, hashtag, you know, hashtag defund the police, hashtag defund MPD, right, the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, so, you know, this demand, you know, sort of began to sort of, you know, get launched into the mainstream of political consciousness. Uh, right after George Floyd's death, and this was launched again by the activists on the ground. And you know, this is something I'm concerned with, right? I'm concerned with thinking about organizing from the organizers' perspectives. So, as we all know, this starts, you know, this raucous debate around the slogan or the demand to defund the police because it's a slogan, but it's also a demand, right? I mean, so um, a lot of times we think about slogan as sort of a functioning of trying to appeal to the broadest uh, consensus of people. Uh, but then also we have to think about these slogans and these movements are trying to communicate something, not to the public, but to people who might um, be, you know, willing to work with organizers on the ground. And it's communicating to people who are sort of uh, the most affected, uh, in this case, by state violence. So, yes, like you have, you know, these debates around, okay, should, like, does this demand or does this slogan, you know, accurately capture what um, the activists want? Um, does it go too far, which is seems to be one sort of argument that people have, right? I mean, because uh, people here to fund and some people will think, well, they just meet, like, these activists 
uh, they're calling for the abolishment or the abolition of police or the eradication of police and law enforcement. Um, and then you have some who are going to say, well, we're just thinking about redistributing money from law enforcement to other areas, uh, you know, social, such as social services. And if someone were to ask the question, well, like, you know, which one is it? I'm going to say it's all of the above and I'm going to explain. But this is what I was trying to get at when I wrote at or when I wrote the defund the police piece um, for AHA, right? Just trying to think about this debate uh, that's going on because, no, oh, this was an idea, again, that organizers, uh, that uh, even abolitionist activists or, or intellectuals such as uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Mariam Kaba, um, Angela Davis, right? To varying degrees have been thinking about this for years, right? I mean, so, um, Defund the police as a slogan, again, as a demand, uh, is coming out of years of organizing around police violence and police brutality. So, Austin? Yeah. May I ask you a question? I'm sorry to interrupt you. I want to ask just a quick question before you move on. And because, you know, the title of uh, tonight's session, um, the language that we're using is so important, and that's maybe where humanists really do bring a certain skill set to this this conversation is is language. Um, t- tell me, tell us a little bit about the term or the definition slogan in the sense that is it your is it your understanding that slogans are intentional, constructed, you know, no new tax kinds of bumper sticker things, or are they more organic and sort of take off that way? And is there a difference? Uh, I would say, again, sort of all of the above. I mean, so um, if you think about a presidential campaign, right, I mean, you have people who are thinking very intentionally about the language that they want to use. And usually when when one is trying to craft a campaign slogan, again, it's sort of to build a very, very large consensus, right, for the most part. Um, There are other slogans, right, that we are very familiar with that, you know, that comes from a presidential campaign or or a particular administration that uh, is, I think they probably perceive it as trying to craft a majority, but it's often perceived as sort of um, signaling to a particular minority within this country that a very narrow vision of of American citizenship or American identity is more accepted, right? Whereas, you know, in terms of other demands, um, you know, such as black power, you know, to a degree, right? I mean, uh, some of these demands come from the grassroots. Does that mean that they're, that people who are using them aren't thinking about them at all? Again, not necessarily. The, the, the problem is it becomes really difficult to, to distinguish, right? I mean, so right. when did, you know, the sort of, if we jump ahead for a second, when did Stokely Carmichael and others really start thinking about uh, using the term black power, right? I mean, it's like, uh, we'll we'll hear from him later about them thinking about it before, um, but again, right? I mean, it's it's coming out of their experiences with organizing, their experiences with racism. Uh, so there's a little depending upon the context, right? I mean, whether it's a presidential campaign or a sort of legislative campaign of some sort, or a campaign to build broad consensus, uh, or you have you know a demand or a slogan that comes out of uh, people's struggles on the ground and experiences right. uh, with particular forces. Yeah, there's been a lot of conversation in the chat box tonight, and I suspect your conversation will go in this direction. But there's there are conversations around why certain words have been chosen, why certain yeah. words kind of latch on. And, you know, if, and if it is organic, if it is a product of the passion and the genuine, authentic um, interests of those those who are using the slogan, it seems like it would be pretty hard to turn to turn that on a dime and come up with a different one that also represents right. passion, right? I mean, it, it does seem like it sort of lives inside of itself at a point. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, I mean, there is something to be said with you know Black Lives Matter, um, defund the police, right? I mean, because mm-hmm. yeah, if you go to a march, you go to a protest, you'll see people holding signs with all kinds of sayings on right. them, right? I mean, but then. Yeah, there's something to some of these uh, slogans where and demands where they just, you know, capture the zeitgeist of right. the particular social movement. I mean, it's hard to tell which one is going to do that. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Yeah, you know, so and this sort of leads me to the next slide, right? I mean, demands and slogans meant to communicate desires and goals, right? I mean, so 
you know, this probably isn't a surprise to anyone listening. Um, and but I think a key word uh, here is desires too, right? I mean, so yes, there might be a goal to, um, you know, totally rethink or reimagine police. Uh, but for many people who have been doing this uh, sort of work on the ground, organizing against police, police brutality, organizing for transformative justice uh, within particular communities, uh, many of these people do believe, right, that um, we could build a better system of public safety and defunding the police becomes a strategy towards doing that, if, especially if the goal is to eventually create a system that uh, does not include law enforcement as we think of it now, right? So when thinking about uh, this demand and this slogan a little deeper, again, uh, defund the police, um, as, especially as it's been circulating in the media and public discourse, it's a critique, right? It, it's a, it, it challenges uh, the sort of reformist um, impulses uh, within, you know, whether it's within some people who are, who are going to marches, participating in the movement, because again, these movements are very, very heterogeneous, right? They're not all, you can't paint it all with one, with a broad brush. But then also um, when thinking about the public discourse, uh, whether it's politicians, media people uh, participating in this conversation. And um, when thinking about, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's, we're at a point to where we might be able to think about the George Floyd murder, uh, but then also the the, the killing of uh, killings of Arbery, Tony McDade, um, and Breonna Taylor as a watershed moment. Um, you know, with especially when thinking about the escalation of protest tactics, right? To include, uh, you know, which is why they included uh, property uh, destruction. Right? I mean, so like we seem to have reached this watershed moment, and if we think about this moment as being a watershed moment, the moment before you had um, you know, whether it's President Barack Obama establishing a task force or you have um, local police departments um, that began to sort of adopt uh, reforms such as body cameras, um, even thinking about Eric Garner's death, you know, um, the chokehold was the NYPD banned the chokehold in 1993. Eric Garner still is killed on video using a chokehold, right? I mean, so um, you have activists who've been doing this work who have grown frustrated with these uh, reforms, right? I mean, whether it's NYPD, you know, you know, coming out and changing policy, whether it is the establishment of body cameras, which um, does not necessarily prevent uh, police from brutalizing or killing anyone, let alone just black folks, right? Just anyone, right? And, and this is the thing is that you have to think about, okay, organizers and activists, the goal is to have a system where the state doesn't kill or brutalize anyone, not just have a system where if that happens, then let's try to hold police officer, officers accountable. And even then, right, that's, you know, the, the likelihood of holding a police officer accountable is, remains very difficult, right? I mean, so um, when thinking about where this demand comes from um, and this demand being to fund the police, it's coming out of a critique of the advances and the gains. And, um, of Black Lives Matter. And this is typical of social movements. When you think about social movement theory, uh, movements often win reforms. Uh, but the persistent, uh, but if, if there's a persistence of oppression, then there are going to be certain folks within this movement that will become radicalized, especially as the people who are satisfied with, with reforms drop out, right? So like you have, the, we've seen the persistence of the uh, brutalization, uh, the harassment, and the killings of black, brown, indigenous folks in the United States, uh, you know, since, you know, 2015, 2016. Um, so, you know, that's another thing to keep in mind when thinking about, okay, how does this demand um, sort of, you know, sort of arise, right? I mean, and this, you know, politicization of more people, but then also the radicalization of organizers, um, that's what helps shift of the goals for the social movement. So brings us to uh, a, a quote by Sadia Hartman. Um, and this appeared in an article, sort of like in an in interview, uh, where, you know, she's trying to think about, you know, so where did this demand come from? 
And I'm going to give you all a couple, like a, a minute just to like read this over and mull over it uh, because I thought it was a really good sort of distillation of, you know, the origins of the defund the police in this iteration of the Black Lives Matter movement. So as you can see in in the quote, um, you know, it's sort of reflective of, of a couple of the points that I've already made, right? I mean, again, uh, the slogan arising out of dissatisfaction with the current legal system, uh, inability to prevent black death, you know, prevent state actors from, uh, you know, brutalizing, harassing, and killing black, brown, and indigenous people. Uh, but again, the slogan arises out of a decades-long movement uh, to abolish prisons, right? I mean, so for those who are thinking, well, you know, like I've heard that uh, defund the police actually means, um, you know, getting rid of law enforcement, there is some truth to that. Again, this is a long-term goal for many of the abolitionist activists, uh, but that's still the goal, right? I mean, and, and I want to be clear and honest about that because I think sometimes we get into these conversations about what this means and there's people who wanted to uh, redefine it because it, they a lot of people will project what they want to see onto social movements, especially if they feel like there is, uh, these movements have, uh, what am I thinking of the term? They have uh, sort of more, more moral standing, right? I mean, like if, if people believe a movement is good, they want to be involved. And a lot of times being involved, a part of it is um, sort of projecting what you want to see you know, what kind of world you would like to see. And obviously, again, what world you would like to see isn't always going to um, mesh with those who are, you know, organizing day to day. But, you know, at one thing that comes out of abolitionist work and, and, and social movement work in general is that you just try to get involved, right? I mean, that's how you can help shape uh, the direction of, um, you know, protests and, uh, and social movements. So, like I said, um, you know, this demand, you know, arises out of a, you know, long history um, of, you know, prison and police abolition, right? I mean, so there are some who, again, take this demand and this slogan literally, like the goal is to abolish law enforcement and prisons and replace it with a different system of public safety that is more democratic, that more people um sort of, you know, can participate in sort of deciding what justice looks like, but then sort of enacting justice on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I mean, and this has, you know, larger ripple effects, which I will explain in a second. So um, when you think about prison and police abolition, it, it, its roots are in the abolitionist movement to emancipate those who are enslaved in the United States, right? I mean, so many, I'm sure many of us are familiar with this movement. You know, we don't think, we don't necessarily think of it as one of the most radical social movements um, in the history of the United States, but it actually is, right? This idea that um, you're not only trying to, uh, you know, you're not just necessarily trying to emancipate people who have been enslaved, but you're trying to overturn an entire economic system and an entire way of life, you know, as some folks, you know, will like the code things, right? I mean, and that's true. Uh, so, you know, what we see is, um, in 1935, um, soci black sociologist W.B. Du, Bo du Bois um, writes a book called Black Reconstruction, analyzing uh, this Reconstruction moment, right, the, the, the post-emancipation moment. And this is a book um, where a lot of current abolitionists derive their uh, sort of inspiration from, right? So, like, not just the abolitionist movement, right, this, the interracial movement to emancipate slaves and to sort of uh, you know, destroy the slave system and build something new in its place. Um, but then there's this text that's very important uh, to people like Angela Davis, again, um, you know, uh, Miriam Kaba, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, and no, like I, I included this quote from Du Bois because what he's trying to do, what he tries to argue is that abolition um, in the United States, especially after emancipation, wasn't just about emancipating slaves and giving them the right to vote, right? It was about trying to rebuild a society um, that was predicated on human labor, right, forced human labor, uh, but that would totally transform the South. So not just 
you know, passing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, abolishing slavery, um, you know, extending the right to vote, uh, you know, guaranteeing legal rights, but to even think about, you know, redistributing land from, uh, you know, from slave owners and, and, and landholders to freed people, but then also thinking about how, how does the United States build a society that democratizes um, not just uh, itself legally and through the franchise, but also through the economy, right? This is where you get this reference to industrial democracy. You had uh, not just black people like Frederick Douglass, you know, who are sort of advocating for a more deep vision of democracy, which Du Bois calls abolition democracy. You had white folks who were advocating for similar visions. Does that mean that they believe, uh, does that mean that they liked all black people and they might not have harbored uh, racist stereotypes? Not necessarily, but they also believe that the South and in turn the whole United States had to be transformed uh, from eradicating slavery all the way through um, extending uh, uh, land to uh, black people, but then also to creating an economy that is more democratic, uh, that is more reliant on workers making their own decisions and people making their own decisions on the ground, right? I mean, so again, there's this ripple effect from this idea of abolition um, that abolitionists in the in the 18th and 19th century and then in the, in the post-emancipation period tried to strive for, but then also that abolitionists uh, today also try to strive for. Again, this is all about trying to democratize society. So, you know, that's some of the, you know, long history of, you know, where this demand comes from. And when I was writing this AHA Perspectives piece, uh, the debate, you know, it reminded me of another debate uh, in in black history um, around a particular slogan. And that debate was around black power, right? I mean, and um, I'm sure, you know, many of us, you know, are rather aware that um, Stokely Carmichael, Willie Ricks from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they launched in 1966 uh, that summer. And it just, you know, as historian Peniel Joseph, um, you know, writes in his history of black power, it's scandalize the country and what that meant was right i mean this this demand shocked people um, but before i you know talk more in detail um, i have a couple of videos that i want to show that sort of explains the context and the moment in which um stokely carmichael and the student nonviolent coordinated committee um launched this demand okay so what i'm going to do austin is i'm going to play these on your behalf um, okay. For our audience, both of these clips, I'm going to play one at a time. Uh, they're both will pop up in your window and you'll be able to hear the audio directly from the presentation. Um, neither one of them are particularly long. So if something goes wrong in the technology with you, never fear. Uh, this first one is about two and a half minutes or so. Just bear with us until, uh, until we come back. But uh, Austin, we're going to let this, the video play in its entirety. Okay. And this will be the one titled James Meredith's March Against Fear. So, yeah, like the, like, the, uh, like the video, you know, stated, right, after Meredith was shot, Carmichael, Martin Luther King, uh, Floyd McKissick from the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, other civil rights leaders and, and people joined to continue and finish Meredith's march. And they eventually uh, you know, reached Greenwood, Mississippi, right, which was a you know strong outpost for SNCC, um, where the police uh, arrested Stokely Carmichael. And again, like the video said, um, you know, police, uh, you know, white folks in the area would typically come out and harass the marchers because they opposed black people protesting for civil rights. And then on the night of June 16th, uh, 1967, 1966, sorry. Um, Starkly Carmichael comes out and he gives a speech, you know, launching the demand and slogan. Um, and um, it's a pretty famous speech. I couldn't find a clip of that, but I could find a clip of him explaining uh, his use of black power, which I think might be more um, informative for us in, in this conversation. Okay, so let's play this second video. 
and we're going to play it now. All right, to uh, use the term black power, SNCC had already decided this before the march. It must be properly understood. We decided to use the march for an education purpose. Number one, we wanted to push strongly our struggle against the war in Vietnam. So if people look clearly at the merit of march, you will see anti-Vietnam propping up here. King wasn't using it then, but you will see this is one of the areas where we started to hit him with it seriously. Our march was to put strong nationalism in, to have direct leadership uh, from us, and of course, to throw out black power for the mass of the people. Now, I myself had been in Greenwood, Mississippi since early 60. I'd worked in the project there, and when the head of the second congressional district, this was our base. So I had spent time in the jail in Greenwood so many times. The police knew me, the police chief knew me, everyone in the town knew me. So we decided Greenwood, it was Nick's strongest base in the Delta. We couldn't go wrong. Unfortunately for the police, we went to set up some uh, tents there, and the police had decided to arrest me. Okay, so before I was arrested, we were discussing Greenwood. This is where we will launch Black Power. So when I got arrested, uh, Ricks uh, was on the side there when the police said, let them arrest you. We'll get you out of jail, and you come out and make the speech tonight. And he disappeared. Well, you know how Ricks speaks. So <laughs> anyway, I went to jail. But... Uh, I was brought out, and uh, when I was released, it was at night, the speech was going on, and uh, when I came to the speech, I was in line, Ricks came back, he said, we have everything prepared, we're ready for black power, we've uh, spoke about it all day, we've uh, primed up the people, and luckily for us, our biggest problem was Martin Luther King, because I knew that once uh, black power was uh, said, Martin Luther King would have to come, not uh, fight against it, but would his best try to give reasonings to water it down. But uh, luckily for us, the night in Greenwood, King had to go to do a taped uh, television thing, I think, for Meet the Press. So he had to go to Memphis. So he was not there the night in Greenwood. Ricks had everybody primed. He said, just get to your speech. We're going against freedom now. We're going for black power. Don't hit too much on freedom now, but hit the need for power. So we built up on the need for power. And just when I got there, before I got it, Ricks was there saying, hit him now, hit him now. And I kept saying, give me time, give me time. When we finally got him, we dropped it, black power. Of course, they had been primed, and they responded immediately. But I myself, to be honest, I didn't expect that enthusiastic response. You know, and the enthusiastic response obviously not only shocked me, but gave me more energy to uh, carry it on further. Uh, by the time we got down that night, SCLC was running around everywhere. We knew it was finished. We had made our victory. They could not bring it back. So, right, Carmichael, you know, in that clip explains, right, I mean, the, the strategy that went behind the launching of Black Power. Um, so, and again, sort of to come back to earlier the conversation, um, again, this sort of a combination, right, of, of, you know, strategic placing of a demand or launching of a demand or launching of a slogan, but then also this slogan coming out of the grassroots, coming out of, um, you know, political desires and, and, and a uh, critique of the civil rights movement, which up until that point had been a struggle for uh, legal integration, um, you know, you know, make it like enshrining or re-enshrining, to be completely honest, voting voting rights. Right. I mean, in, in ending segregation uh, in, you know, in public accommodations and employment, et cetera. Um, whereas, no, when Carmichael comes out and makes this demand, um, it's for something deeper. But I will talk about that in a second. What I'm going to talk about first is there this, this demand comes out and then there's a race to redefine black power because it wasn't just that um, you had, um, you know, white Americans who might have been afraid of the term. You had black leaders and black people who also came out against the term. You know, one example, Roy Wilkins, the NAACP president at this time, um, you know, calls it, you know, it, he basically calls it, uh, you know, anti-white, right? I mean, he, he defines black power as, as sort of the inverse or the reverse of white power, right? I mean, so like, you know, this is the leading, one of the, this is a leader from one of the leading uh, civil rights organizations in this country, part of the big six, as they call them, right, the, the sort of major leaders. Uh, Roy Wilkins, as you see by this quote, you know, he, you know, he, he says that black power leads to black death, right? And then you have Dr. King, who uh, Carmichael mentions and sort of plays a central figure in their strategy, you know, in thinking, okay, what's going to happen if we launch this, especially if King is present. King wasn't present. Uh, but King did respond, and King's response 
wasn't as uh, you know oppositional uh, or even hostile as in the as Roy Wilkins is. Uh, King's response was more nuanced, um, and in the New York Times, uh, you know, around the time where he publishes his last book, "Where Do We Go From Here: Chaos or Community," um, he he sort of you know expresses uh, some of you know his reservations around the slogan. Um, in his autobiography that's edited by Claiborne Carson, you know, he, you know, is telling, he, he's asking Carmichael if they can reconsider the slogan. Um, and as Carmichael stated in the video, and then as Andy sort of, Andy asked at the beginning of this talk, right, I mean, once the slogan is out there, right, there is no way you can put that cat back in the bag, especially if it's a slogan that catches on pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, you think about Martin Luther King's uh, you know, response, nettlesome task of Negroes today is to discover how to organize our strengths into compelling power so that government cannot elude our demands. We must develop from strength a situation in which the government finds it wise and prudent to collaborate with us, right? I mean, so King is trying to redefine redefine that demand in that slogan too, away from self-determination and towards a meaning that is about engaging um, you know, the, the sort of the current political institutions, right? I mean, again, something that we've been seeing with uh, defunding the police. But later, um, Carmichael, you know, who later changes his name to Kwame Torre, and political scientist Charles B. Hamilton, uh, they write a book called Black Power, The Politics of Liberation. Uh, and in this book, um, which I would encourage everyone to read, um, you know, they stress the need for Black people to uh, reject structural racism, um, but also, you know, black power is about developing racial solidarity, organizing around democratic principles, and creating their own communities. So again, uh, black power was about self-determination, and part of the piece about self-determination that's important is in the changing of, or the choosing of language. And in his article, you know, sort of going backwards, and taking a step back, um, Stokely Carmichael wrote a article called What We Want that appeared in the New York Review of Books in September 1966. And I'm going to read a quote that sort of, you know, I think might resonate with how we think about this on the police. So he states, an organization which claims to speak for the needs of a community, as does the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, must speak in the tone of that community, not as someone else's buffer zone. This is the significance of black power as a slogan. For once, black people are going to use the words they want to use, not just the words whites want to hear. And they will do this no matter how often the press tries to stop the use of the slogan by equating it with racism or separatism, right? I mean, so again, this is sort of more evidence of this slogan sort of coming out of the movement, right? And again, sort of thinking about even with defund the police, coming out of a movement and that community being those who are participating in the movement, not just those who are outside observing uh, or maybe even going to marches, but not as intimately involved in the movement. So, you know, like Carmichael and Snick were thinking about how this term was being received, because on the one hand, you had people who wanted to redefine it. On the other, you had some who wanted to co-opt the term, which is something that happens when you're thinking about social movements and organizing. And, you know, the person who tried, you know, the, the hardest and might have been the most successful in some ways in co-opting the term was President Richard Nixon. He gives this radio speech um, called Bridges to, Humanity, or Bridges to Human Dignity. Um, you know, this is April 1968. Um, so this is a couple of weeks after um, Dr. King is assassinated. And in this speech sort of outlining um, a, a vision for, in some ways, racial reconciliation after all of the uprisings that followed, uh, Nixon comes out and argues the third, a third bridge is the development of black capitalism, right? I mean, so he begins to equate black power with black capitalism, right? With integrating black Americans into the economy, but not just as workers, but as owners of property. And this is an idea that even Stokely Carmichael in 1966, in that same uh, article that I mentioned, was against. Right. I mean, Stokely Carmichael, like Dr. King, were moving in a more radical di direction when it came to um, reorganizing uh, the economy. So, um, I didn't, Andy, did you have something to say or ask? 
Uh, we've got some questions that are queuing up, but I, it feels to me like you're connecting uh, some dots here. Uh, we've got about a half an hour left, a little bit more maybe. So um, I'm going to let you keep going. And then uh, I would okay. remind our audience, if you do have specific questions to add them to the Q&A tab, they'll come to me directly. And as the moderator, I'll, I'll bring them to uh, Dr. McCoy. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, no, this is perfect. I mean, because, no, like I will be, you know, I'm sort of rounding down um, in yeah. this in the slides, so then, you know, we'll have plenty of conversation in terms of, uh, you know, what folks think or, or questions. Uh, so, right, Nixon tries to co-opt this term. Again, this is something when, when those of us who study social movements and organizing, um, this becomes a piece of the equation, right? Whether it's, um, you think about, um, you know, the, the existence of, of discontent or oppression, uh, structural or otherwise, um, people then respond by protesting, uh, by trying to organize uh, groups that push for a, you know, long-term, like a short, medium, or long-term goal. Sometimes they accomplish these goals. Uh, but then at the same time, you might have uh, those who are working in political institutions or particular institutions that might be the target that seek to also co-opt some demands or incorporate some of these demands. And then again, to come back to what I was what I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, you know, you have people who might drop off, might drop out, might not participate as much in the movement because they believe that, well, the movement has accomplished what I wanted it to accomplish. But then you still have people who continue to organize, and that process usually radicalizes the people who continue to work. Um, and th that doesn't mean that they won't change strategies and start running for office or anything like that. But in terms of thinking about solutions to particular social problems, a lot of times these solutions uh, for some can become more uh, sort of radical, right? I mean, so um, this is part of like, what Nixon does is what a lot of people who uh, work in institutions do, right? I mean, so this isn't, some, this isn't like a conspiracy. This is just what happens when you go through this political process. So to come back to uh, defund the police, right? I mean, and this is something I was noticing um, in the audience chat, but then also in conversations um, on social media, but then when you watch the news, um, you know, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of consternation, there's a lot of people who, you know, see the demand, they wonder, you know, why use the term defund, like why, you know, why not use another term, um, people being frustrated, right? Because, um, you know, they want the demand to mean something else sometimes, right? Um, but, you know, for many, if you're thinking about this from the perspective of, of, pro, of organizers who have been doing this work for years, um, you know, a lot of them uh, take it literally and take it to its logical conclusion um, of abolishing the police. And some might say that's radical. And in fact, that's absolutely radical. Um, but then again, it's about, you know, trying to understand where these demands come from, where these slogans come from. Um, and there are many, again, who are going to believe that the most effective demand and slogan is going to appeal to what people think is already accepted or acceptable, right, in terms of policy, in terms of, um, you know, who should, you know, become president. Um, and the thing is, is that when it comes to social change that is driven by the grassroots, driven by people who are organizing and protesting, the goal isn't to just try to sort of, um, I was going to use a bad golf metaphor, but I'm not going to do that. Like, I think it'll just make things more confusing. But if to, to do that, you have to sort of expand the boundaries of, you know, of whatever, um, either expand the boundaries of the particular, of your society, or you have to dismantle, you know, you have to dismantle um, or even destroy some institutions, some some things in society in order to build what you want to build on top of it. This sort of comes back to thinking about abolition, right? I mean, um, you like it, it, it's hard. Like if if we think historically about um, enslavement, um, this country had to go to war in order to uh, eventually. Uh, abolish slavery and emancipate slaves. And, you know, if you think about it from a Du Bois standpoint of view, um, you know, slaves uh, sort of, you know, taking, you know, taking up, you know, uh, or sort of, you know, taking back their labor, you know, and going on strike, you know, like in response to the situation, right? I mean, so, um, you know, what does a war do, do, 
a war destroys things, right? I mean, like there's not a war that there's nothing sort of productive about a war. A, that war destroyed um, slave society. The the uh, the sort of um, the the uprising of slaves at that point destroyed slave society. And the goal of you know and what happened after that was an attempt to rebuild Southern society. Um, in a more democratic fashion. Obviously, it wasn't totally successful with the rise of Jim Crow, but then also the emergence of, um, you know, Ku Klux Klan, right, and, um, you know, racial violence against Black people in order to, um, you know, sort of um, try to maintain a system that was as, that could take uh, to Southern society back as close to slavery as possible, right? I mean, so... Professor, I've got to... I'm going to interject a question here because I think it it ties together some of what you're saying and where this may uh, take us for the the last uh, back half, back third of our conversation tonight. I'm going to take Robert Shaw Smith. Uh, he's joining us from Atlanta. I'm going to take several questions and try to uh, sort of meld them together. Uh, but Robert's really interested in and making comment around, um, and I don't use this term dismissively, but sort of the grammar of some of these well, just, uh, some of these slogans. So, for example. Uh, black power has no verb. Defund the police. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Similarly, Black Lives Matter has an uh, indicative verb, but it's not an imperative. Um, how, how does how do those kinds of grammatical choices, which are, you know, which any teacher or librarian would say is is not a, a minimal thing. It's not a trivial thing. But how how do those those phrases respond to those to that grammar choice? Right. I mean, so. When thinking about, you know, including a verb, um, well, one, right, I mean, Black Lives Matter, Black Power, Black Power, both powerful slogans, right, powerful demands, um, you know, and they're sort of an assertion of, you know, a group's self-determination. So on the one hand, it is, it's it's very threatening, right? The idea, like, Black Power was very threatening at the time, um, and it was very threatening because of living in a society that is structured around anti-black uh, racism and racial segregation in the South, right? I mean, like, and this is going back to the period of enslavement where you had, uh, you know, slave owners, but then also just you had white people in general who were afraid of black people rising up and taking control of the country, like Haiti, right? I mean, so like, you know, like that, you know, these these slogans were, you know, very powerful. And, and oftentimes, you know, when people thought that Black Lives Matter, right, as I'm going to say, you know, in a minute, right, still reviled, right? I mean, like, even though it's just a declaration of, a, of an obvious fact, right, Black Lives Matter is a declaration, right? And it's still reviled. Why? Because I think of this deep history of, of uh, white Americans being suspicious of Black people organizing. Defund the police is a command, right? It's a command. And it is, it is a command that is launched in a society um, that, you know, has structured the idea of public safety around the idea of police, right? I mean, so I think, you know, the verb is important, but also the, the quote, the police part is important, right? And in, 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 in thinking about the police's role, and that's what this demand is doing, is it's not only commanding, but it is challenging people to sort of think about um, the role that the police plays in the United States, uh, not just now, but historically. I mean, and, and the sort of analog um, to defund the police. Um, can I can I be explicit? Can I can I use a curse word? I don't you know can, if y'all have. This is, this is adults. Uh, we're having an adult conversation. Okay, so so what if we replace defund with fuck the police, right? Which is some, which has been a slogan, right? Like. It, like you will hear NWA, you know, when you go to protest, um, and this song that they, you know, produced and released in 1988, 1989, produced all kinds of consternation <laughs> among Americans, especially law enforcement, right? And law enforcement began to organize against NWA and these record companies in order to censor uh, the group, which they failed to do, right? I mean, so um, part of it, I, you know, I think. I think the observation of okay, define there's a there's a verb there. You know, is there a distinction between it, that and the sort of declaration of fact that Black Lives Matter is, or sort of um, you know expression of a desire um, that black li- that black power is. Uh, but then part of this, it's not about defund. 
part of this is it's about the police, right? And anything that might challenge police power becomes a challenge uh, for for a lot of Americans, especially now. It becomes a challenge to what it means to be an American in this country and be and, and an American being you know someone who is quote unquote lawful. Um, so like right, I mean it's like if we're gonna analyze the words. You know, we got to analyze all the words when thinking about the, when thinking about the slogan and demand. Great, thank you, thank you for uh, for addressing that and defining that um, that connection. Um, a couple more questions before we move on uh, too far and and start to conclude tonight's session. Um, let's go back a little bit to the beginning of your talk. Uh, uh, William Scampoli asks, were there areas in the South uh, where former slaves? I'm sorry. Which, I apologize, William, I just uh, tried to read your question and I both, let me try again. Which areas of the South were former slaves most successful after the Civil War? And can we still see that impact in those same areas today? Most successful in terms of, um, you know, building communities and uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> like it, it, it's a very, and it's also a very specific question. It's not like, how should I put this? Um, I guess it depends upon how long, right? Like how like how you define success and how long um, success lasts. Um, because, right, if you think about, like there are, you know, obviously black people after, uh, you know, emancipation built very strong communities. Um, one of them being the Greenwood section of Tulsa, right? Which, um, as we've known because of our current politics, right, I mean, the Tulsa massacre, you know, that took place in 1921, which is where I start my modern U.S. history class. Um, you know, like that was, you know, one of the most successful black communities um, that, you know, is, you know, technically depends. It's not in the sort of slave, uh, a, a slave holding confederacy. You know, it's not, in the, it's not in the old Confederate states, but it's like, you know, sort of it's it's we think of it as, you know, not northern at the very least, right? I mean, and no. Um, you know, like Black Wall Street decimated. Why? Because because uh, black people were were successful, <laughs> right? So if you're successful, you became a target, right? I mean, and then if you think about, um, you know, if we were to think about, you know, black communities in Atlanta, right? I mean, like, I mean, you know, I think that's one place where you can think of a sort of success story, um, but not success in terms of like just unmitigated, uh, you know unimpeded success i mean because again um these communities are being built in spite of racism and they are constantly being threatened and policed uh not just by the police but by white people who want who wanted to take back land right i mean after the civil war there you know many whites try to fight another war and the goal wasn't just to subjugate black people it was to take back land right hence the uh the the uh, the 1898 uh Wilmington, North Carolina, mm -hmm. coup de top, basically, right? I mean, where um, black people had amassed, you know, enough political power to sort of, you know, help, you know, make political decisions. And then, um, you know, once, you know, once, you know, the, the, uh, the, the mayor election happened and many white people were not happy with the results, they basically drove out black people, right? I mean, so, um, you know, Thinking about success, there are instances of success, but these successes uh, are oftentimes sort of, um, you know, always under threat, and and it's hard to disentangle success, right, of Black communities from the threat of anti-Black racism. Great. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and bring to you a question from Kyle Jones, who's joining us from Louisville. Hey, Kyle, good to see you back in a webinar. Uh, Kyle is interested to hear how you think each slogan, in this case, Black Power and Defund the Police, operates as a critique of capitalism. Are there similarities mm -hmm. or differences? Um, and he's also curious about the role of the media in advancing uh, a slogan. Has the changes in the media landscape altered the efficacy of a slogan, especially if it seems anti-capitalist? Right. No, that's a really good question. And um, in terms of black power, um, I'm going to come back to Stokely Carmichael's What We Want. And towards the end, right, so when I was talking about how Richard Nixon um, tried to co-opt the term and sort of, you know, 
bring it closer together to black capitalism, which, you know, there were black people who followed and who were also thinking this way. I won't say they, they followed uh, Nixon. They were also thinking in these terms, right? And this is like Roy Ennis, who was uh, one of the leaders of the Congress, Congress of Racial Equality, right? I mean, be, he also began to advocate for black uh, capitalism. But, excuse me, but Carmichael, right, in this, in this piece, and this is September 1966, he writes, but our vision is not merely of a society in which all black men have enough to buy the good things of life. When we urge that black money go into black pockets, we mean the communal pocket. We want to see money go back into the community and used to benefit it. We want to see the cooperative concept applied in business and banking. We want to see the black we want to see black ghetto residents demand that an exploiting storekeeper sell them at minimum cost a building or a shop that they will own and improve cooperatively. They can back their demands with a rent strike or a boycott and a community so unified behind them that no one else will move into the building or buy at the store. The society we seek to build among black people then is not a capitalist one, right? I mean, so Carmichael is already thinking about the, the radical implications of black power. And, you know, if you, you know, think about um, the, the use of the of words like communal, cooperative, right? I mean, like these are ideas that have been circulating among uh, Americans and, and people throughout the world who believe in a more um, sort of uh, socialistic uh, society at the very, very, very least, right? I mean, so like he's tapping into a tradition that is, you know, that's deep in the United States, but then also deep uh, in many parts of the world um, when he starts, you know, thinking about black power as a critique of capitalism. Now, in terms of defund the police, um, if you if we think about defund the police as a strategy towards abolishing law enforcement uh, and the criminal justice system as it is currently constituted, then the other piece of that and the other piece of abolition um, is um, the idea that, okay, well, if the idea is or the understanding that comes out of this is police serve to protect private property, then um, to, if, if, if we're going to eliminate the police, eventually we also have to eliminate, uh, you know, an economic system that's grounded in private property. Right now, what does that economic system that is built on top of it look like? You know, I don't know, you know, like that's something that you would have to sort of read more um, abolitionist work um, and, and, and do and sort of think more about. Um, but that is the underlying critique. And again, this sort of, this comes back to W.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, and um, him, you know, basically um, analyzing the uh, Civil War and Reconstruction through a Marxist lens, right, and through the lens of thinking about, um, you know, who has economic power um, in the South, but then also throughout the United States, and this idea of, well, an abolition democracy would include, at the very least, um, what, you know, he and other sort of labor uh, organizers and labor intellectuals have called like industrial democracy, but at its most radical where you had workers who were owning their own, who were owning all the enterprises, making all the decisions about um, not just wages, but also about, um, you know, production, right? I mean, so, you know, anti-capitalism, when, when you think about um, defund the police, or at least when you do a genealogy of defund the police and abolitionist work, um, but then also same with black power, right? They ha there is an anti-capitalist uh, strain that runs through both of them. Great. Thank you for tackling that question. Um, we have about 15 minutes, uh, Professor, if you'd like to move through the rest of your slides and then I'll answer the, I'll ask the final questions at the end. All right, sounds good. So um, yeah, coming back to defund the police, right? And um, you know, it's like I was saying, right? Like this has generated a lot of conversation, you know, for some folks it's very exciting, for some folks it's, you know, um, it's concerning for some folks, it's frustrating. Um, but, you know, like the thing about radical political demand, right? I mean, because this is a radical political demand. Um, this isn't, you know, the idea, again, of defunding the police. Um, the idea of defunding institutions, right? I mean, there have been uh, movements on the right side of the political spectrum, right? Who have advocated for, you know, these sorts of measures. Um, but, you know, advocating for defunding a institution that is, that, that a lot where a lot of Americans feel is very central to their lives and their personal safety is very radical. Um, but 
you know, when you when we when we begin to see, you know, people in the media, right, which is part of the other question, right, in terms of um, sort of, you know, giving currency and talking about, and sometimes depending upon who you ask, diluting uh, some of these uh, slogans and demands. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that again, like these demands, you know, are often coming out of political struggles, um, and they're not market tested, right? I mean, so like if you were to, um, you know, conduct a study, say like um, you know, some folks um, did, you know, in this article, well, they conducted a study, but then published some of their findings in this Washington Post article, um, you know, sure, right? I mean, like the idea that there are Black Americans, uh, there are Latinx folks, there are, you know, a majority of Americans uh, don't advocate for getting rid of the police at all, uh, and might have, you know, concerns about defunding. The thing is, though, is that um, if you put every slogan up to a vote, especially a radical one, right, if you put black power up to a vote, it might not win out, right? I mean, and that's not the point. The point is to advance a demand on a particular institution that pushes the boundaries or even in some cases uh, breaks the, the boundary, right? I mean, and defund the, defund the police um, and many slogans, right, they, they were, it's about reflecting the collective will to build and exercise political power. Right. I mean, so it's not just like convincing people, especially when you're doing organizing, especially one to one is important. But what you're doing is organizing to build and exercise power. Right. I mean, and uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's an uh, abolitionist intellectual uh, critical geographer. Right. Uh, she defines power as not a thing, but rather a capacity composed of active and changing relationships, enabling a person, group or institution to compel others to do things they would not do on their own, right? I mean, so on the one hand, we can sit here and, well, does this term, you know, does this term make the most sense? Is it the most clear? The question that activists on the ground are asking isn't how clear is the term, but what kind of result does a term, does a demand, does organizing get, right? I mean, because obviously um, some of these, uh, you know, gains aren't done just because of a slogan. But the slogan becomes a starting point for negotiation, right? And this is, you know, and this is why we've seen 13 cities pass measures to defund the police um, this summer, you know, with Minneapolis City Council voting to disband their police department altogether, right? I mean, so, you know, because of protests, right, and because of this demand and this demand circulating and people, you know, you're going to all these protests, even here in Auburn, where I see a white person holding a sign that says defund Auburn police, right? Which is, some, which is something I'm sure um, folks living here would not have thought would happen five years ago, right? I mean, so things have accelerated in terms of Black Lives Matter and this demand has become so powerful, it becomes a negotiation point. Um, and it also becomes a point for people who are in these institutions to say, okay, well, if defunding the police is what they want, well, we can try to, you know, take away a hundred million dollars, right? I mean, um, so what, What's interesting and ironic is there's a critique of the Occupy movement that happened, you know, almost 10 years ago, where it's like, well, there was no, you know, the slogans and 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 there were no demands and, and the slogan, you know, we are 99% and the 1%. Okay, that seems clear, but there wasn't there there didn't seem to be any sort of action plan. Defunding the police is an action plan, at least at least a start of one, right? I mean, so yeah, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, these other cities, they see the slogan, okay, we're going to push and make cuts. Now it's up to the activists uh, to sort of continue to do their organizing and to keep pushing um, to, um, you know, get to a point to where they begin to, they think that they can begin to rebuild their communities in the way they want to. So again, right, I mean, defund the police, this demand, this call, right, it's about collective will and trying to exercise power. Like I've, you know, said before, you know, there are other slogans, right, that um, or about mobilizing broader electoral and political coalitions, right? I mean, you see some of them, right? Yes, we can, right? I mean, with we being the biggest, you know, uh, you know, on on that poster, Medicare for all, right? I mean, again, this is about everybody, you know, for everybody, right? But, you know, for all is more pithy. Um, and then, you know, a, a slogan that seems pretty, that should be pretty familiar coming out of the Ronald Reagan campaign in 1980, let's make America great again. Right. I mean, and this is obviously, um, you know, we can we can have conversations about, you know, the sort of 
um, you know, implication, the political implications, you know, pulling the United States out of economic crisis, um, you know, pulling the United States out of a foreign policy crisis with Vietnam, um, and then the Iran hostage crisis, but then also um, we can think about the sort of long history of this uh, slogan intersecting uh, with whiteness in, this, in the United States. And then obviously, as we all know, it's been um, sort of updated over the last four years. Uh, but then what's also been an interesting outcome is that we are now seeing Black Lives Matter being painted on streets, right? I mean, so this slogan was reviled in 2014, 2015, Hillary Clinton and others coming out and saying, you know, and, and critiquing the slogan Black Lives Matter, which again was just a statement of fact. It was an assertion of the humanity, a statement of fact. And you had Democrats, Republicans, uh, many people coming out and critiquing, you know, why isn't it just all lives matter? Why isn't it just all Black Lives Matter, right? I mean, again, right, these slogans come out, these demands come out, and there's always going to be critiques of them. Uh, but now, this slogan, this demand is being painted on city streets and it's being, and, and who's doing the ordering of painting some of these? Yes, it's some grassroots people, but mayor of New York City, mayor of Washington, D.C., right? I mean, so it's like, and yes, there's some trolling going on with the president, but six years ago or five years ago, we would not have imagined Black Lives Matter being painted on the street, but still, right? It's still, you know, a slogan that's misunderstood, uh, that is reviled, right? among a particular segment of the American population. I mean, so again, this demand, even though it feels like it's a whole lot more acceptable now um, and more respectable, right? There's still debates about it. And there's still people who are asserting uh, their own sort of counter uh, demand or counter slogan. So I'm at the, I'm at the last slide. And, um, you know, I just, I, I guess what I want, you know, what I wanted uh, everyone to sort to to get a, get out of this conversation, and I look forward to um, you know talking more about your questions. Is um, you know I think this is a moment where we see a slogan, we see a demand like defund the police come out, and yes, it's important to sort of keep up you know with the news, keep up with um, the conversations that are happening in um, you know in sort of established political circles. Uh, so to speak, or political discourse, but also this is a time when it's about, okay, well, how do we do a deep sort of history of some of these uh, demands and slogans that come out of these movements? Because they just don't come out of nowhere, right? And they're not just sort of products of uh, political cynicism, right? I mean, these are um, parts of long-term projects. So, you know, reading the works of people like Angela Davis, Miriam Kaba, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who you see is on your slide in front of you, right? And again, this goes to show again how you know far this movement has come. Where the New York Times is, you know, writing up a long profile of Ruth Wilson Gilmore in, in sort of thinking about you know her decades-long involvement um, in the abolition, abolitionist movement, right? I mean, and for many abolitionists, uh, you know, who are op who are working right now, uh, it's a movement for freedom, right? I mean, there's people who who will say, well, you know. Um, abolishing the police or prisons would just lead to chaos. If you ask them, they're going to argue that it, that something else can be done, right? Um, and this is, again, you know, when you come back to the abolitionist movements of the 18th and 19th centuries where um, people could not imagine a world without slavery, and then it happened. And then people had to, people and institutions had to rebuild society and rebuild something that would replace that would replace that economic system. Now, obviously, whether or not that's successful, whole nother, you know, round of scholarly debates, right? But like, that's what happened, right? I mean, so these folks today, right, they're advocating for another vision of public safety that is grounded in a black political tradition, but it's also grounded really in a uh, tradition that has been circulating in the United States, right? And it's about deepening, um, you know, conceptions and visions of what democracy can look like, right? Because, yeah, you know, many are going to agree that democracy can function um, if people don't feel safe. But the argument is, we might not need prisons or police to feel safe. We might just need each other to feel safe. And we, and we might have to collaborate on trying to devise ways uh, to do this, right? I mean, so abolition is not something that's top down. It's a bottom up movement. Uh, and this is why, right, I mean, I've learned over the last several months um, that 
defund the police is, is provocative, but it's also an invitation, right? That's what democracy is. It's an invitation to get more involved, to learn more, and to want to demand to have greater say in decisions in all aspects of life, but in this case, especially when it comes to public safety. Fantastic. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you, Professor, before we um, before we wind up tonight. And, and, and one of them, I think, um, maybe asks you to put a little bit of a finer point on your concluding remarks. This is from David Olson, who's joining us from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and he noticed in your blog post, the AHA article that is available in the digital library as a pre-reading. It's also what I read um, and reached out to you to do tonight's webinar, uh, that you noticed that there was, uh, in that blog post, that there were divisions within and among civil rights leaders and their disagreement over language. But he his sense is that there's not as much debate among black leaders today about the defund slogan. Do you have any sense mm -hmm. whether that's true? And if so, why that's the difference? That's a good question. Um, and you know, um, so there's one way to go about this, right? I mean, so yes, like there was much debate about black power um, and, you know, among civil rights leaders, right? I mean, and this is just a product of um, organizing um, and um, having, you know, political differences, philosophical differences, strategic differences. And, you know, I don't think that, you know, that's something that doesn't apply today, right? Now, the question becomes, who are the leaders that we're talking about? Right, I mean, because um, there are leaders on the ground. I would consider Ruth Wilson Gilmore a leader. I would consider Angela Davis a leader. Um, I would consider, um, you know, uh, people, you know, the folks who are on the ground who are doing the work every day. I would consider, you know, members of Black Vision a leader or, or as leaders. Right, I mean, um, so like, you know, there are leaders who who agree, but then there are obviously leaders who don't agree with the idea of defunding the police. It would argue that well maybe there should be so, like redistribution of funds away from uh, police uh, to other services. There should be uh, more reforms that might help uh, hold police officers accountable. Um, you know, like so, like yes, yeah, like I don't know, I, I don't know how to quantify. You know what? You know where there's more disagreement or not. Um, but then I think on the one hand, when it comes to these movements, we have to think about we have to think expansively about what we mean by uh, who is the leader one and then two. Um, we also have to think or consider how uh, public opinion can shift, right? I mean, so there are leaders who might not agree with defund the police, and they might not ever. You know, they might not ever, and that's fine. Um, but then we don't know what could happen that might shift public opinion further, where you begin to have people who begin to think, um, you know, more critically um, about, um, you know, how public safety uh, is, uh, how it operates uh, as it's constituted, right? I mean, so, you know, I think part of this is, is one, the movement is still, like, at least this iteration of the movement is still really young, you know, and it'll be interesting to see if there are other moments that either help accelerate, you know, the thinking around defund the police as sort of an abolitionist demand, or if there are events that sort of begin to slow that process down, um, and we begin to start, you know, thinking more, or people begin to start thinking more about the very, the varieties of reforms um, that um, people believe that law enforcement should have in order to hold police officers accountable. Great. Um, I'm going to give the last question tonight uh, to uh, Maritza Ramirez, who's joining us from Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and she asked pretty early on, but I think it's a great question to conclude with. I'm going to add just a little bit to her question to give maybe Austin, you a little bit more entry to it. But her question was, how, how would you navigate, how would you suggest navigating this conversation with preteens or with students, mm. with relatives in law enforcement. And maybe yeah. I'll even expand that to say, when you have these conversations with your university students uh, at Auburn, even if it's in a virtual environment, um, how do they respond? How, how would you recommend that we navigate this conversation with, uh, with others who, who may or may not agree with the, the premise of the slogan? I know that's a, that is a great question. And, Excuse me. I think this is probably where we can sort of take the uh, take some inspiration from um, some of the organizers who do this work um, when they have conversations uh, about um, you know law enforcement, uh, the criminal justice system, prisons, and oftentimes 
they start they will start by asking questions that are really open ended but really big, right? I mean, so you know, what does freedom mean? But also what do you need to feel safe or what would you what would you need? What kind of institutions do you need? What kind of conditions uh can we need do we need uh to feel safe? And we are allowed to dream this out, right? I mean, so not just well, you know, not um saying not asking that question and then um qualifying it with, well, now let's just be realistic. No, like what if um you could you know what are the alternatives like what can we do you know and a lot of times um i was talking to an organizer um and a lawyer from detroit um who runs you know, amanda alexander she runs the detroit justice center um and um i was talking to her for about about a story i was writing about this and this is what she was just like yeah like a lot of times we'll sit in these conversations and people will name all the things like name everything else but police Right. I mean, so we need clean drinking water. We need access to schools. We need um, better, um, you know, I, you know, we need better health care. Right. I mean, like people will begin to name like many things. And then it's like if you were to make a list, the police sometimes is not going to appear at number one or number two. Right. Or even in the top five. Right. I mean, because people um, like because there are like because in certain situations, people are going to think more expansively about safety not just as this idea, this sort of rather narrow idea of security where it's just like, well, it's about protecting what I have, you know, whether it is my body or whether it is, um, you know, things on my own. And it's not to say that, um, you know, protecting your body isn't important, but like, right, I mean, it's like there becomes an expansive uh, understanding. And then the question becomes, okay, so then um, if we were to, you know, think about or think through alternatives um, or a different vision of public safety or what it means to be safe, then how do we sort of um, engage each other if uh, if any harms are committed, right? I mean, because just because uh, you think you could sort of, you know, think through, you know, alternatives and, or not necessarily alternatives, but think through a different system of public safety or, or a, a system of society doesn't mean you're not going to have people who are harmed, right? It doesn't mean that, um, you know, tragedies won't happen, obviously, right? It doesn't mean that it just totally eliminates violence. The question becomes, how do you in, how do you prevent and how do you intervene? And then get people to start thinking about, you know, okay, well, how do we do this without have without people um, feeling threatened by those who are supposed to be uh, serving as, you know, you know, the public safety? Um, you know, there's one example: um, Huey Newton, leader of the Black Panther Party, who argued for a people's patrol. Right? I mean, now this might kind of sound like it's similar to what we might have, but his argument is, well, actually, we have a people's patrol. This is democratically elected people. Um, everyone gets to serve, you know, you know, on this, in this people's patrol. Um, and this, is, you know, and without sort of trying to go into too many details, because I can't remember all the aspects of it, but the, I, but the understanding is, is that, well, if everyone is, is invested in everyone else's, you know, safety, um, but obviously not in a way that is sort of mediated by surveillance and technology, you know, the surveillance technologies and, and harassment and things uh, that might come up today, um, then you might be able to, you know, create a different type of system of public safety, right? I mean, that's just like sort of one historical, rather obscure example, right? And, and there, you know, my friend, uh, you know, Amanda Alexander is talking about how um, they have, you know, sort of recruited teams of people who perform transformative justice um, you know, or, or do work of transformative justice in Detroit, right? I mean, and it's like, you know, this becomes a way of intervening. Or another Detroit example, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Peace Zones for Life, this idea uh, that was created by former Black Panther Ron Scott, who uh, was trying to uh, find ways to, you know, sort of interrupt, you know, potentially violent situations through mediation, but mediation among people who are already in the community, right? I mean, so, um, creating a different system of public safety isn't, you know, the idea, it, it isn't about, um, at least according to th these activists, it's not about creating chaos, sowing chaos, et cetera. It's about, okay, how do we create a different system that is, that they believe is more humane and that could actually, that actually might prevent violence, right? Or it might actually deliver some justice that's worthy of the term. That's absolutely a fantastic place to end. Thank you so much. And I, I also want to emphasize the uh, the importance and the role of the authentic role of educators in the, 
the vision that you just outlaid. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, uh, Austin McCoy. Yeah, no, this was awesome. Thank you all. I also want to thank uh, Brianna Holtz for joining us from Delaware as our teaching assistant. She added many uh, just great comments and resources in the chat box. If the chat scrolled out of uh, sight and you didn't have a chance to grab them, uh, go back to the Humanities of Class webinar series group in the digital library and you'll be able to find them all tagged. They are free and open and we would love to have you use them. Uh, thank you again for joining us for another uh, uh, episode, another session of the Humanities in Class webinar series. You can follow the National Humanities Center on our website, on our Twitter feed, and on our Facebook page for uh, updates and for upcoming events and opportunities. That does include our next webinar, which is scheduled for September 22nd. We'll be joined by Kimberly Hamlin, who is a uh, associate professor of history and global and intercultural studies at Miami University in Ohio. And Kimberly is going to be working with us on, um, on analyzing and assessing the 19th Amendment and its 100th year anniversary. Thank you again, everyone. Please do uh, have um, be well, be safe, uh, have a great day at school tomorrow, even if you're in your laptop. We'll see you next time at the Web uh, Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.